in July of 2006, a team of very smart people, I mean, these individuals are the type that do 5,000-piece puzzles on their break, okay? You must be very smart. They got together, convened from various disciplines for the sole purpose of developing a definition for the word information. They called it UDI. It's the Universal Definition of Information. Yeah, yeah, very clever. But who are these very smart people? Well, Werner Gitt is a creationist, and Jason Lyle is a creationist. John Sanford, Bob Compton, creationist, creationist. Hang on, I'm beginning to spot a pattern here. So I wonder why snarky apologists didn't tell us that the entire list is composed of creationists, who, not surprisingly, made the definition fit the conclusion they wanted to reach, which is that DNA is information and language is information, so if languages were designed, DNA must have been designed. I told you they were clever. We know that information always, always, always comes from intelligence. The problem is creationists are in a bit of a catch-23, which is slightly different to Joseph Heller's catch-22. Because if DNA is information, then we can't say that information is always, always, always designed, can we? Because we don't know that DNA was designed. So either the rule is wrong or DNA isn't information. Take your pick. And if it was designed, then who designed it? Certainly none of the gods and goddesses on offer, because we know from scientific evidence that the feats attributed to them never happened. The only god it could have been is one that sprinkled DNA on the Earth over three and a half billion years ago and then let it evolve, as the evidence clearly shows. And I don't know of any religion that has that as its credo. But what about languages themselves? Surely they were intelligently designed. Many cultures didn't have words like transistor. They either had to make one or use the English version, which was made up. Why, that's new information. It's just like evolution, isn't it? No. Those languages were intelligently designed. Uh, huh? If you think languages are intelligently designed, Ian, well then, tell me who designed Italian. Modern Italian evolved over several generations from Old Italian, which evolved from Latin, which evolved from an unknown Falcian language, which, if we trace it all the way back, came from an ancestral Proto-European language. There are intelligently designed languages, to be sure. This is Klingon, and yes, someone with intelligence, arguably, did sit down and design it. But Juby's talking about the languages we speak every day. Of course, some words, like transistor, were intelligently designed, because when a new invention comes along, someone has to give it a name. But most of the words we use today weren't designed. They evolved from ancestral words through mispronunciation or dialect changes, such as the great vowel shift in medieval English. As people moved across Europe, the Sanskrit word pada became the Latin word ped and the Danish word fod and ultimately the English word foot, simply through subtle changes in the way succeeding generations pronounced vowels and consonants. Some words like de-evolution come about because of ignorance of existing words. The meaning of words can also change through common use and misuse. Look at how the meaning of the word gay has changed in just a few generations, and people are literally misusing the meaning of the words decimate and literally. You only have to look at Anglo-Saxon or read Chaucer to see how the way we speak has changed. And thanks to the medium of recording, we can even hear it for ourselves. The working-class young man says that the shirt he admires is posh, whereas the upper-class young man would probably call it a peach. Yes, this really is how we used to teach foreigners what's called the Queen's English in the 1960s. In class-conscious England, using the wrong kind of slang can be very damaging socially. On this record, all the idioms and the slang are in every way socially acceptable. Hello, Johnny. You're looking a bit down. What's eating you? Oh, I fluff my prelims. Few people today have an accent like that, and fewer still would talk about fluffing their prelims, unless they work in certain cinematic vocations. This is also how the Queen used to speak back in 1957. Because of these changes, I'm not surprised that many people feel lost and unable to decide what to hold on to 
and what to discard. But just listen to how her grandson's accent has changed just two generations on. No matter what, you can progress with your life. You can do things beyond any imagination that you ever thought was possible. Creationists would no doubt call this change microevolution. In other words, evolution we can actually see or hear. But of course these small changes, given enough time, add up to big changes. How can they not? But I'm sure that in support of his case, Ian's going to give us a nice example in the medieval sense of the word. Just like genetic information, languages are de-evolving. They are becoming simpler, not more, cl- not more complex. Uh, for example, English used to have masculinity and femininity applied to inanimate objects, just like French does. Yeah, a thousand years ago, Ian. First of all, taking one example from that far back from just one of thousands of languages is no evidence that all languages are becoming simpler. In fact, if we look at English, since it dropped grammatical genders, it's got more complex in its vocabulary because it's had an infusion of thousands of new words. Anglo-Saxon had about 30,000 words. The Oxford English Dictionary lists 600,000 in modern English, 170,000 of which are still in use. That aside, even Juby's premise is wrong. Becoming simpler doesn't mean the language is, as Juby calls it, de-evolving. Losing grammatical gender can be regarded as an improvement of the language. After all, why do we need a house to be neuter, or a table to be masculine, or a door to be feminine, as they are in our sister language, German? For the word the, German has an entire table of words. I love Germans, but sorry guys, your definite article sucks. As for the French, you say j'ai mangé, j'ai bu, but you say je suis allé. What's wrong with you people? If someone designed all this stuff, then he has to be either a sadist or a complete idiot. When you look at a language that has been designed, like Esperanto, the designer, Ludwig Zamenhof, did away with all these confusing rules and irregular verbs and grammatical genders and made the language simple. That's what denotes intelligent design. Creationists like Juby are obsessed with what they call new information. New information. A gain in genetic information. Genetic information. To be classed as evolution, they think a language and a species must be infused with new information. But of course, languages and species evolve by changing. That's what evolution means. So just because snakes lost their legs as they evolved doesn't mean they've gone into a worse state or are going backwards. They lost their legs because they adapted to a niche in which they didn't need legs and in fact had a higher chance of surviving and passing on genes without them. So the fact that languages evolve and we can see how they evolved and we can hear them evolving makes for a very good analogy with biological evolution. As a language splits through geographical separation and isolation, at first the two daughter languages are mutually intelligible, just as animals distantly related can interbreed with difficulty. Then they become mutually unintelligible. French Canadians separated from French a few hundred years ago, but the languages are still mutually intelligible. Well, okay, only just. Even so, French Canadian movies have to be subtitled in France. After further isolation, languages eventually become mutually unintelligible, just as time and isolation leads to new species that can't interbreed. The language of Dutch speakers who migrated to South Africa and cut themselves off from the mother country eventually became Afrikaans, which my Flemish and Dutch friends say they can't understand. And yet both came from the same ancestral language. So language can be quite useful in explaining some misunderstood concepts in biological evolution. For example, when I was explaining genetics in the video Human Ancestry Made Easy, I said one piece of evidence as to our origins in East Africa is the rich variety of genes found there. Populations that stay put and don't migrate will, of course, have a lot more of these genetic markers. So it's not surprising that we find the greatest genetic diversity in Africa. But the greatest of all belongs to a people... If we look at this in terms of language, the way language diverges into different accents and dialects as population groups move apart leads to the same phenomenon. Two recent studies found that most of the sounds, or phonemes, used to make language are found in Africa, and the number decreases the further away from Africa you go. This parallels exactly the path taken by our genes in both time and space. 
it confirms that all the world's languages derive from a common East African language about 150,000 years ago, just as our genes do. Let me give you an example closer to home. Drive 20 miles west from the centre of Manchester, and most people have a completely different accent. They sound like John Bishop. Is it better if they had a, a funny death? The what? It a, a funny death. A like, phony I death? No, a funny one. <laughs> Understand what he's saying? Yes, I do. Thinks I'm Hungarian. <laughs> no, is it kind of every second word or none of it? Every it's, second. It's word. about every third or fourth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this could be quite a long show. <laughs> we're talking backstage to Matthew about coming to Liverpool, and it's, we have different accents, mm -hmm. very, very close to each other, all over England, isn't it? All yeah. over Britain, it's very, very different accents, mainly because if people speak different than you, it gives you a reason to hate them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Could you do an English accent? <laughs> Could I do an English accent? <laughs> Drive 60 miles in the opposite direction, and they sound like... Oh, ah, yeah, brilliant, Stephen. Yeah, I'm sure there was... You know, obviously, there was one, there was the boys, really. I mean, there was ones coming up with this... All these fancy ideas of dual acting pistons and heater tubes and all that fair play, oh boys. But they want the boys machining to be fast. How was there? Was there? Hey? You're right. A proverbial Martian would be able to tell very easily that American English derived from British English and not the other way round, simply because of the richness of different accents in the UK compared to the United States. Here they are on the same scale. In exactly the same way, one of the ways we know that humans originated in Africa is because of the richness of the gene pool found there. And in answer to the creationist's often asked question, if humans evolved from monkeys, why do we still have monkeys? Well, it's like asking, if Afrikaans evolved from Dutch, why do we still have Dutch? Duh. If languages didn't evolve and no humans designed them, then what's the creationist alternative? Well, here's Conservapedia pushing the anti-science viewpoint with a familiar tactic. Pretend there's a debate among scientists. The only alternative offered up by Conservapedia is that languages popped out of nowhere, just as all the animals and plants did. And what's its source for this fact? Its only reference? This, a passage from the Bible. It describes how people got together after the flood and cooperated in building a town and a tower. Well, that sounds nice. And, of course, God wasn't too happy about that. If, as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language, so they will not understand each other. Thanks, God. So is there any evidence for this Tower of Babel anywhere except the Bible? Eh, of course not. No archaeological or linguistic or genetic evidence at all. So creationists have had to pluck one out of thin air. This is uh, the Chinese written language. Of course, they use pictographs, uh, you know, images that they will use different uh, to make up different words, and then they'll combine them together to make sentences make and new words. This kind yes. of thing, yep. yeah. And so, it's very interesting that the Chinese word for tower is grass plus clay plus mankind plus one mouth. Everyone speaking one one way, one language. Ah, ah, ooh, that actually sounds very convincing. Except it's complete bullshit. These elements are called components, and it's true you can often dissemble simple characters and get the meaning based on these. For example, this is the character for a person, here in the form of a component called a radical, and here's the character for a tree. So if you have a person leaning against a tree, you have a character that means to rest. Get it? Characters like this are called associative but this one isn't associative, so you can't simply add up the various components and make your own little story. This type of character is called pictophonetic, because while one component, the radical, gives a hint of the meaning, the other component is purely there to indicate the sound. We'll come to that in a minute. First, let's embarrass creation ministries by showing not only how they don't understand the difference between associative and pictophonetic characters, they don't even understand what the components in their example mean. The key radical in the character for tower is this one, meaning earth. It stands to reason because that's what early Chinese towers were made of. But what's next to it is an archaic character that has two meanings, a small bean and thick. If we break it down, it's composed of the radicals for grass, 
and this very common character meaning combine or unite. But if we break it down further, Creationist Ministries is completely wrong in saying that this radical, meaning one, combines with a mouth to mean one voice. It doesn't. It goes with the radical G, a person, to give us the meaning one people. So one people at a gate gives us the character H, meaning assemble or come together. Get it? Nothing to do with one language at all. But the whole exercise is pointless anyway, because as I said, this is a pictophonetic character. This component is there to guide you towards the right pronunciation, which I hasten to add is not necessarily the one I've given you. To use English as an analogy, the letter T in the word Britain is there because it tells you how to pronounce the word Britain. It's not some secret code telling you ancient Britons used to drink tea. How do we know this? Because scholars have been studying these characters for hundreds of years, and we can even see how they've evolved. The first Chinese dictionary was published nearly 2,000 years before the first English one. Let me give a parallel example in English. The word cupboard is a compound word, the equivalent of an associative Chinese character, because it puts two words together, cup and board, to describe something quite literally. Even if you didn't know what a cupboard was, you could take the word apart and figure it out. But you can't do that with most English words because they're purely phonetic. You can't take the word ketchup and assume that each component is telling the story of a sailing boat being lifted into heaven, because that would be stupid, right, creationists? This desperate attempt to link Chinese characters to biblical stories has become a favourite among creationists especially this one. The Chinese word for create is za. To create or creation. The character for create. Create in Chinese is the word za. Before we hear more, let me first explain that this character, once again, is pictophonetic. So while this radical walk indicates the meaning, the second component, which means to tell, is purely there to indicate the sound. Ah, but let's watch as creationists unravel the character anyway. I'm going to press a buzzer whenever they make a mistake. OK, here we go. So we have dust. It is made up of dust. OK, this part. No, this part isn't a part. I know it would be nice if there was a character for dust in there, because then it would fit the narrative. But there isn't. This is the four-stroke radical for a cow. Don't try to ignore this small stroke because it means alive or to live. Sorry, but putting this and this together to invent some radical meaning living dust not found in any Chinese dictionary is a complete load of baloney. The reason Chinese scholars know this is a cow, and any Chinese etymological dictionary will tell you it's a cow, is because the character zao, meaning build or make, has been written for thousands of years and its evolution has been documented. Here's one of the oldest inscriptions dating back to the Bronze Age, showing that the pictograph is a cow. That's what the character for a cow looked like back then. And even though the length of the vertical stroke has shortened over the centuries, it's still a cow. If I had a carton of Chinese milk, I could show you. Oh, here's one. See? Cow! So in the character for build or make, this doesn't mean dust, this doesn't mean life, and this doesn't even mean a man. As we've seen, it means a mouth or an entrance. You get all three wrong, and still have the balls to tell me this made-up crap is in the Bible. What a load of b****. <laughs>